All right, so let's start. So hi, everyone. My name is uh, Olivier Grisel. I'm a um, software engineer at Inria and uh, a, a core contributor to the scikit-learn project. And I'm going to be joined afterwards, hopefully, by uh, Tim Head, who is in the train right now, um, to, uh, to teach this tutorial uh, on scikit-learn and machine learning in Python. So for today, uh, I will give a couple of uh, a refresher on the machine, main machine learning concept uh, on the slides. And then I will introduce the scikit-learn project uh, as a software open source project. And then we will have uh, the hands-on workshop uh, in an interactive uh, uh, Jupyter notebook. And so we'll do uh, uh, predictive modeling uh, on census data, um, survey data on the American population. And we will use uh, pandas and scikit-learn mostly to do that. And uh, there, there is another part of this notebook uh, on a, a parameter tuning using scikit-optimize and also scikit-learn components. And uh, if we have time, we have additional exercises, but I think that's going to be enough for today. Um, so what is machine learning or what is predictive modeling? Uh, the goal of machine learning is to make predictions uh, of the outcome of some ph physical phenomenon or social phenomenon uh, based on the data that we collect. And the goal is to make prediction on what's going to happen in the, in the future on stuff that we cannot observe yet or we haven't observed yet. And we do that not by um, hard coding the rules of the behavior of the system in the code of the program, but by writing a program that will extract the, the structure of historical data by itself and, and uh, generate another program, basically, that can uh, uh, make predictions based on the historical data. And the mathematical tools that we use for that are statistical, st traditional statistical tools. And they basically try to summarize uh, the structure of the training data and, uh, and uh, make that summary executable somehow uh, as a predictive model. And so you can see that machine learning is an alternative to hard-coded rules written by experts that know about the phenomenon. If you don't know the underlying rule that generated the data, you can try to guess them uh, using a statistical tool. And sometimes you, you see that this is conflicting with uh, hard-coded uh, written rules by experts. But uh, in many cases, uh, we use machine learning in situations where we cannot write those rules because we don't know, or we cannot ask experts to make recommendations very quickly, for instance. If you, if you write a, a recommender system for a retail website, you cannot ask uh, book uh, re, uh, experts to make a personalized recommendation to all of your millions of users because it will be much too uh, costly. Uh, so I think machine learning is, is useful in that setting where you need to make many small predictions that have uh, uh, the, the impact of this prediction is not too, uh, if you make a mistake, is not a, uh, a big problem. Uh, but uh, on, on aggregate, if you make good predictions or better than chance, <laughs> uh, it can be useful. So it's a bit abstract, I will give examples later. So the first example of uh, machine learning, for instance, is to use the historical data of a real estate agency where uh, past customers describe um, uh, the assets that they, they, they sold uh, in that agency. Uh, so for instance, you have the type of housing, apartment, house, duplex, whatever. Uh, the number of rooms, uh, which is an integer, whereas the type is a category. Um, the surface is square meters, the, uh, whether or not it's close to uh, public transportation, uh, as a Boolean flag, for instance. So you have different uh, descriptors of the records, and they can have uh, heterogeneous types. And there is one specific column in that database uh, that, that has the value of a variable that we are really interested in, which is the price of the transaction. Uh, so those are past events, so we have the price for those. But if a new customer uh, arrives in the agency, uh, just before that, uh, so the, the, 
in the uh, machine learning vocabulary, or at least in the scikit-learn uh, vocabulary, we describe this data according to those names. Like the, the records in, in that database are the samples, because they are sampled from a, a fixed distribution. This is, this is the hypothesis that we make. Um, the, the columns or the descriptors are, are called features. And uh, the variable that we are trying to predict is called the target variable, the target column. Or whatever. And so if you have new customers that go into that agency and describe their assets, they, they ask the real estate agent uh, for an estimation of the price uh, they could possibly sell uh, the, their housing. And so either you ask the real estate agent and it, because by habits they know about uh, the stuff, they will do a good guess. Otherwise, what you can do if you don't have access to an expert is to try to find a statistical summary that relates the target variable to the features based on the past data and to apply it uh, to uh, fill in the question marks. So we can write that as data, uh, a data flow. So you start uh, on the right hand side from the historical data and that data can be of very different kinds uh, of formats, in very different kinds of formats. For instance, it could be uh, text documents, images, sound recordings, or transactions in a database. And there is one specific attribute or column, uh, which we call the labels, which is the target variable uh, that we're interested in predicting. So for instance, for images, it could be the, the class of the main object in the image, or whether uh, or not this image, this image uh, should be moderated out of the website or not or something like this. And for sounds and images, typically you have to uh, collect uh, human annotation on the data. Whereas for transactions, if it's an automated process and you want to detect fraud, for instance, in, a, in activity, you can uh, collect historical uh, fraud uh, events and, and you use that uh, transaction of, of past events to, to make prediction on the future. And in that case, uh, the annotation can be semi-automated. So the first thing that we need to do is uh, to uh, format the data into some numerical representation that we call uh, feature vectors. So, so that each image or each text document or each sound is going to be tra translated into a one-dimensional uh, numerical array, an empire array, for instance, uh, that, that describes uh, the interesting parts uh, of that record. And so if you batch uh, a bunch of records together, you have a 2D uh, array, two-dimensional array, uh, which is the, the training set. Uh, and so you give that two-dimensional array of input data plus the labels for each of the, those records to a machine learning algorithm, and there are many of them, uh, but uh, most of them uh, will accept this as, as long as the data is formatted syntactic, syntactically uh, this way. It's going to run. Maybe it's going to output something uh, useless, but it's going to run. Uh, and what the output of this machine learning algorithm is the, the model. And in the future, you can reuse that model. You can uh, deploy it on a, a separate machine, for instance, and uh, accept new data. You need to extract features the same way that you did for the training set and pass that feature vector to the model and, and uh, the model will predict the expected label and sometimes it can also predict uh, some confidence level. So there are many applications of machine learning. Those are uh, people using scikit-learn uh, to build applications. So for instance, uh, the, the New York Times is using statistical models to uh, model the virality uh, and the, re the reader's engagement on their website. Uh, Airbnb is using a lot of machine learning, but uh, among other things, they, they do uh, fraud detection or uh, uh, price uh, hinting. Um, Spotify uses machine learning for personalized re radios, playlists based on past user habits. Uh, Birchbox is, is doing uh, inventory forecasting and trend detections for fashion, fashion items. Uh, Caterpillar is putting sensors in their machines, in their vehicles, and they, they collect operation data from the vehicles to do predictive maintenance, so to, to build the statistical models of normal operating device. And uh, as soon as they detect new stuff that were not uh, 
that are unlikely according to the statistical model. Maybe it's because something is going to break. So you can uh, uh, um, plan ahead in the future, maintenance effort. And uh, you can also, on dating website like OkCupid, do personality matching or basically it's a recommender system. So they, there are many applications, and those are business applications that at Eurocypa, I think you're more interested in, in science, and you know probably already that there are many applications of uh, machine learning in science to analyze data, to filter it, to remove background noise, and, and so on. So scikit-learn is, is a library of machine learning algorithms, and we try to focus on established methods. Uh, there is a book which is called Elements of Statistical Learning, uh, the second edition, and it's uh, available for free as a PDF online. And basically, the, those are the kind of statistical methods that uh, we implement in scikit-learn. And we, not, we don't necessarily uh, implement the latest uh, research paper because we want to wait a bit to make sure that it's actually useful to other people than the initial researcher that, that wrote the paper. Um, it's uh, maintained as an open source project under the BSD license, so you can use it for whatever you want. And um, the, the main feature of Scikit-Learn is we try to provide a homogeneous API for all of those uh, statistical models. So most of the models, uh, all of the models, we have at least a fit method to fit the data, to train the model. And then they can either have a predict or transform a method to either make predictions or to transform the data into a new, a new vector space. Uh, it's written in Python using NumPy and SciPy for the uh, um, uh, vector pro processing and optimization. And sometimes some of the models, uh, they don't benefit from a, a efficient array operation and they need uh, nested for loops, for instance. And in, in that case, we use Cyton for to compile uh, the, the performance bottleneck of the uh, algorithm, basically. But, but most of the code is written in Python. Uh, we also provide a bunch of additional tools, like tools to uh, evaluate the quality, uh, the, uh, ac the accuracy of models, of trained models, and uh, how to tune to select the best models and how to tune the parameters, and how to build ensembles of uh, a group of models to make a, an ensemble model that performs better than the individual component. So in practice, if we take the data flow and we reshape it from top to bottom, from training data uh, to predictions, and um, in practice, uh, the, the Python API looks this way. So we, st we start by creating a model, instantiating a class with, for instance, logistic regression, which is a classifier in scikit-learn. Um, and then uh, we need to make sure that we have the, the training data formatted as a 2D array uh, for the input the features, which is called X-Train. And uh, the output uh, labels should be a 1D array, most of the time it's 1D, uh, Y-Train, which could be integers or uh, real numbers. Uh, if it's integers, it's interpreted as categories. If it's uh, real numbers, it's interpreted as a continuous variable, like pre trying to predict the temperature, for instance. Um, so the first for, with integers, this is a classification problem uh, with a continuous variable, which is called, uh, we, we named the, the machine learning problem a regression problem. But it's basically supervised machine learning anyway. Um, once we have, at the, at the end of the call to fit, the model is modified in place. The, uh, the model object is, is modified. And you can reuse it to make prediction. And you cannot make prediction without calling fit before. And so basically, you, you call the predict method on a 2D array X test, which is the new data, and you will get as an output a 1D array of predictions that has the same kind of type as X train. And then, uh, if you have access to uh, the true labels for the test data, you can evaluate the, mo the quality of the model using a, a scoring uh, function. For instance, you can compute the accuracy if it's a classification problem like this. Uh, the accuracy is just the number of times uh, we make a correct prediction that we have uh, the, the good category. The average number of times we have the good category. And so just, uh, I don't know if I have jokes. <laughs> no. 
guys know. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. So just to explain something that uh, why do we use x and y as variable for the data is that x and y are traditionally used uh, in mathematics. If you have a function, the input is x and the output is y, basically. And basically here, uh, we are not trying to compute the output for a given x and a given f. We are, we are given uh, x and y, and we try to to build a, a Python program that will relate the two. And the output of the machine learning algorithm is f, basically. So, but this is why we use x and y. When you, when you do the, the mathematical description of those models, it's natural to use like x and y. All right, so um, there are many algorithms in, in scikit-learn. I won't uh, explain in details what they mean from a mathematical point of view, just how to use them. And then you will have to look at the documentation and to read the literature. Uh, we, we give the reference to the main papers uh, in, the, in the API documentation. And so uh, I will just uh, introduce some of uh, the most useful, uh, the most used. So for instance, support vector machines uh, with a, a RBF kernel, which is a nonlinear model uh, that is quite powerful on medium data. On, la on large data, it's probably useless. But if you have less than uh, 1,000 records or a couple of thousand records, I think it's, a good, it's good to try this one. Um, so you just import it, the SVC class from sklearn SVM, and you instantiate the model and you give the hyperparameter of the model. So those are models that, you, uh, those are parameters that the, the user needs to set in advance and they will control the behavior of the learning algorithm. And we will explain later how to find uh, that automatically from the data. Um, and so once you have built the model, they can do fit, predict, and uh, compute the accuracy or the F1 score, which is another performance metric for classification. Uh, and, and the bottom of, of this uh, workflow is always the same. If you want to, to train uh, a new kind of model, you can just change the first two lines the import line and the line that defines the model structure. So for instance, if you want to choose to use a linear classifier instead of a, a, a non-linear uh, support vector machine, you can import from the linear model package SGD classifier, which is a linear model trained with stochastic gradient descent. And it has different parameters, hyperparameters, but the API is the same. And if you want to try random forest, for instance, you just pick up the random forest, and you can uh, give the number of trees you want in your forest, and, and so on. So there are many algorithms in, in scikit-learn. Uh, it's a bit too small to read, but uh, here I, I give uh, the output of the prediction of uh, different uh, algorithms in columns, and they have been trained on different problems uh, as rows, and so those are all binary classification problems. You have to classify whether a dot is going to be blue or red based on the location on a 2D plane. So it's a completely toy problem, but it highlights the fact that uh, they have very uh, different performance behaviors based on the statistical assumption they make on the, on the on the structure of the data. And so, for instance, the first row you have two uh, blobs of um, of data: the blue blob and the red blobs, and they are they are basically half moons. That, that overlap a bit like this. So there is no linear separation boundary between the two groups. You have to find a, a wobbly uh, decision function, basically. And you can see that the linear model, uh, like those two columns, LDA here, linear discriminant analysis, and linear SVMs, they are linear models, and logistic regression would be the same. They can only find uh, a decision boundary, which is a hyperplane in the space of features. So in a 2D space, it's just a, a straight line. And, and in that case, the, the performance, it's written, it's, it's small, it's 80% for the first one, so it's, uh, it's, it's not very good. Uh, whereas the, the first one, nearest neighbors, is, is able to find the structure. Uh, and if you look at, for instance, RBF SVM, uh, th this column, it's quite good at finding a smooth decision functions that follow the shape of the data. For, and for, for this data, I think it's, it's the best in this case. And the second row is just uh, blue dots in the middle and uh, they are surrounded by red dots on the other side. And here again, the, the, the 
the linear models are, are very bad. Uh, but then on the noisy data, the last one is just two blobs with overlapping data points. I'm sorry. Ah. <laughs> sorry, the team is calling. <laughs> hey, I'm doing the tutorial right now. <laughs> Where are you? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, it's not the same location as last year. It's the, um, I think you should look up on, on Google Map on, on the venue. You have the Google Map link on the website. <laughs> and I uh, don't, I uh, don't have internet. Uh, let me. Uh, no, it, it, it's uh, it's not exactly nearby. It's like a forty-minute walk. So uh, you need. To <laughs> Uh, so I, I just I can give you the uh, the address exactly, and then you have to ask people. So it's Stautstrasse uh, five, Staud uh, S T A U D T Strasse five, and so yeah. So it's the uh, it's also the same uh, Friedrich Alexander University Erlangen, but it's uh, the physics department basically. All right. Okay. okay. See, see you in a while. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so, yes. Uh, yes. The the slides uh, they are available on speaker deck slash ogrizol. And it's the first one, intro to scikit-learn. So, speakerdeck.com slash ogrizel. Ogrizel. <laughs> okay. All right. So the the uh, the last row, uh, the data sets is basically two linear, uh, two um, uh, Gaussian blobs, random uh, blobs of points, but they are overlapping, just by chance. Um, and so in that case, the, the input data is very noisy and a linear model is, is, is basically doing what best you can do. And, uh, more complex models with nonlinear boundaries, they are not going to perform better. Uh, but they, they can even perform worse because they could memorize the noise, whereas the linear models is too constrained to, to memorize the noise and will make a better, uh, generalization. Uh, we have a better generalization behavior, basically. So it, there is no, uh, depending on the, on the structure and the, uh, of the data and the statistical assumption of the model, it, it really depends which one is the best. There are some models that tend to perform better than others uh, on average. Uh, for instance, uh, gradient boosting regression trees uh, are very used, uh, are very often uh, competitive in uh, machine learning competitions. And if you deal with, uh, uh, images or sounds or um, this kind of uh, signal data, uh, then uh, convolutional neural networks tend to perform uh, very good and the best. Uh, but and and when you have high dimensional data and few number of samples, then linear models tend to, to perform the best. Uh, but if you, it, it's not if not, it's not a guarantee that you can guess which one is the best uh, ahead of time. So. The best way is to, to try and measure the accuracy and see how they generalize. And I will explain later how to do that. Um, I still have another. Yes? Uh, so the RBF model in, for those three small data sets in two dimensions that are completely fake and don't reflect the reality. Uh, in this case, the SVM RBF model is the best. Uh, but if you have high dimensional data, if, if the, the features are not on the same scale, they have a, uh, here it's a geometric problem and the RBF function is basically good. Uh, if it's, if you have different features that are prices in dollars and, uh, I don't know, temperatures in Celsius degrees and something like that as input descriptor, uh, for, for your classification problem, then the RBF function, is, I th I'm not sure is gonna be good. And typically decision trees are better in that case. Um, so yeah, you have to try. And also another limitation of SVM RBF is that the, the 
computational performance behavior uh, is very weird. It means that when your training size data is, is growing, the model is, is, uh, becomes untractab untractable to train because the, uh, the training algorithm has uh, more than cubic, uh, more than quadratic uh, complexity, time complexity with respect to the number of training samples. Uh, whereas, for instance, a decision tree or a neural network, they do not have this problem. So uh, the RBF-SBM uh, model is good for a medium-sized data set. Uh, so to learn more about the different kinds of algorithms that we have in scikit-learn, you can go to the website scikit-learn.org. And they are organized, the documentation is organized uh, with the main groups. Uh, so for su supervised learning, we have classification and regression. And you, you see examples of algorithms, but you have uh, the, the, the full list on the website. And we have also tools for unsupervised modeling that I won't, uh, I won't introduce during this tutorial. Uh, but for instance, if you want to do clustering, like in this case, you don't have a why, and you don't try to predict a why, you try to predict groups of data based on the geometric structure of the data, like uh, customer pro profiles, for instance. So you can use uh, clustering algorithms. And there are also dimensionality, dimensionality reduction algorithms where you have uh, uh, data in a large dimensional space with many descriptors and you want to visualize it in 2D, for instance. You want to visualize the uh, statistical uh, distribu distribution and repartition of the data in a 2D space. Then you can use a principal com component analysis or um, T-stochastic neighbors embedding uh, t -SNI. Uh, as a uh, visualization algorithm, and basically what they do is a, a dimensionality reduction operation that tries to preserve most of the structure of the data uh, and give you some insight. And they can, those dimensionality reduction uh, models, they can also be used as the pre-processing step for a classification or a regression problem, for instance, or even a clustering problem. So sometimes it's possible to do a pipeline of different models. Uh, and typically dimension, dimension reduction models, they are transformers, where the others are classifiers or regressors. Uh, and there are also tools for preprocessing, and in that case you have uh, also uh, transformer models with a transform method. Okay, we'll, we'll, uh, I will explain that in more detail in the workshop. So, I hope that by now you had uh, a chance to get the tutorial material. If you, if not, you can download it from there. So those are IPython notebook, uh, Jupyter notebook. And so to install Jup Jupyter, scikit-learn, pandas, matplotlib, uh, you should uh, conda use uh, Anaconda. I think it's the easiest way. Or nowadays, Pips works on most platforms as well. Uh, and uh, you can start uh, Jupyter. So if you have not started it yet in the past, uh, it depends on the platform. But uh, on all platforms, you have a terminal on uh, Linux, Mac, and Windows. Uh, so find a way to, to use the command line uh, in, in your operating system. And then if you have installed Jupyter, uh, uh, Anaconda, you should have uh, Jupyter somewhere in your path. And you should be able to do a Jupyter notebook. Uh, making that bigger. What? Uh, so the so for the Wi-Fi, there is only EduRoom, and EduRoom is only available uh, for um, academics who have their own password in their home institution that should work here. Ah, okay, so the new hotspot uh, is being set up right now, and they should give us the vouchers at lunchtime. <laughs> so if you really need it in internet, if you need the Anaconda, uh, there should be two USB keys. Okay, okay. there is one there, okay. Does someone else need the Anaconda? No? Yeah. Yeah, the tutorial is also on the key. So on, on the key, you have a zip file with the GitHub repository with the notebook for today. So uh, once you have installed Anaconda, you should have uh, Jupyter in, in your path. 
Um, okay, in my case, I'm using a virtual environment, so I will just deactivate it. <laughs> uh, this you don't need to do it if you <laughs> activate uh, your recipe. We we'll use the same. Okay, just setting my environment to, to have the, the correct version. So if you start Jupyter Notebook this way, uh, it should pop up a, a brother window, and then you should see the file, uh, the, the folder structure of your operating system, and uh, just pick up a folder or create a new one, and unzip or git clone the notebook in, in, into that folder from uh, outside, and it should, uh, it should show up here, and then you go into that folder. So in that case, I have it under code and uh, Euros IPI, I think. Too much code. Uh, yeah, this one. So, and once you found the folder with the notebooks, uh, you should have this view, basically. So there are three notebooks, uh, a data set, and a folder with solutions. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, where is the second USB key? Uh, can you bring it back to the first row, please? For people. Oh, okay. Once you're ready. Okay. Um. All right. So we will start uh, with the first one. So if you click it, it should open. Uh, I have already opened it here. And uh, I just uh, removed the, the 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 first row and make it made it bigger, but this is the uh, only change. Okay. Uh, so we will use for this session uh, for the first part of this session we will use uh, Matplotlib for visualization, NumPy as the array data structure for vector operations for the data management, basically. And Pandas, uh, as a library, there will be a tutorial, or maybe there is, and no, I think the beginner's tutorial for Pandas is tomorrow. Um, uh, as a library for uh, manipulation of uh, heterogeneous data, like uh, data with different columns, with different types. Um, and so we will use that for as a pre-processing tool for scikit-learn, basically. So the, the data is included. Oh uh, yes. Uh, so you you need to execute all of those cells, and if you want to, um, if you don't want to see the output before executing the cell, it's good to do to go to cell all output clear, and that will clear everything. So we need to execute all of the cells because if you if you miss one, then it will, you will have undefined variables and uh, weird error messages. Uh, to execute a cell, you can uh, press Shift Enter uh, on the cell, and you should see uh, a number uh, execution number increment on, on the cell itself. And then the cursor is moving on to the next one. Um, I hope you already had the opportunity to play a bit with Jupyter, but if not, uh, just a uh, quick intro. You should have uh, a list of keyboard shortcuts here that are very useful in help. And in particular, uh, you should be able to use Control M A, for instance, to insert a cell above, and Control M B to insert a new cell below. And then you can do stuff here. So the cell has, has two states, the blue state and the green state. Uh, I don't remember the names, command and I don't know. When, when you, you can press enter to go into the green state and then you, do, you can do a, a Python code there and execute it. For instance, shift enter uh, and you, you get it. And then you can uh, uh, press enter again over it, and then you get the cursor and edit it again and modify it and re-execute it and you, and you get the new result.
Okay. <coughs> and if you want to execute the same cell several times without moving, you can use Control Enter, which is quite useful uh, if you if you have a random process, for instance, and you want to see random output. This way. Okay. Um, so we can just skip this one, and then uh, we will load the data. Uh, so this cell is useless because the data is already uh, loaded in, in the local folder. Uh, but if you don't have the adult.data file, uh, you could fetch it from the, from the website using this. And then we will use pandas. So this, is, this file, uh, adult data, is a CSV file, uh, which is a survey of uh, the American population, the census data from a uh, 20 or 30 years old. I don't. I don't know exactly. Um, and but the problem with this CSV file is that you don't have the the name of the columns. So we need to specify the names of, of the columns manually. So we can do that using pandas that read CSV. And then we have a, a data object, uh, which is basically a, a pandas data frame. And you can see the content of the CSV file that has been loaded in in a Python object data. And so in that table, you have records that have a number, so 0, 1, 2. Uh, but the actual data has uh, columns with names, like age, work class, FNL, uh, WDT, which means uh, final weight. Uh, this column, we will just ignore it. It's a weighting mechanism for people who are doing census. Uh, I don't know exactly what the statistical meaning of that, uh, so I, de I decided to uh, discard it completely. <laughs> and it actually, this is what is done on, on the next cell here. Uh, we will ignore it for, for this tutorial. Uh, if you really want to do uh, sen census analysis, you should read the documentation and uh, try to get a statistical understanding on what it means. Uh, but we don't need it to teach machine learning today. Um, and then you have, uh, so who needs the key? No, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh, so we have uh, additional attributes, and they have different types. For instance, age is a number. Work class is a category, so it could be. Uh, a kind of works is public, state gov, state of government, or private. Uh, then you have the kinds of education, the type of education, bachelor degree, HS, I don't know what it is, 11th grade, whatever. Uh, and then the number of years of education for that person, the marital status, uh, the occupation. So they are adults uh, after they all have, they are all 16 years old or more. Uh, whether or not they are in a marital uh, relationship, the, uh, the race, because it's US data, so they, they do that, and, the, and uh, the sex, the gender of the person. And actually, there are even more than this. Uh, they, are, they have additional, uh, like uh, financial data, like capital gain and capital loss, I think, over the last year, I'm not sure. And uh, the number of hours uh, worked per week, and the country of origin, and so this, cat this column, this category has uh, 49, I think, uh, possible values, so many possible categories. And uh, finally, there is the last column, which is the income, uh, whether or not the person has over uh, 50K dollars income per year. And the, the goal of uh, this data set, or at least we are going to use this data set to try to build a predictive model that predicts the income of a person based on all the other descriptors. So I said uh, that we will ignore the final weight column, so we can just drop it like this. The, don't forget to execute the cells, otherwise we'll have different uh, behaviors. So we can have a look at uh, um, standard pandas functions methods, and so we can see that uh, all the data set has no missing values because all the features have the same number of uh, non-missing values, and they are uh, 32,000 entries, basically. So it's a medium-sized data set. It's small, but uh, it's not very small, but it's, uh, it's good enough for machine learning, basically. If you just have 100 samples, uh, 
do uh, uh, do not do machine learning on that. <laughs> you, you really need uh, more records than this. Um, so we can use uh, p uh, data that describe to see additional um, 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 statistics on the numerical features of the data set. You can see that the categorical columns, they disappeared. But for the numerical uh, columns, we have additional data, like the, the average age uh, in the data set, uh, the median age, the maximum age, and the uh, lowest, 17 and 90 and the uh, number of uh, years and so on. And in particular, uh, nobody need it. Okay. Uh, the, the hours per week, you can see that in, in the US, many people tend to work uh, 40 hours per week. I think there is some uh, regulatory constraint, or I don't know. Um, so we can also use pandas to do aggregations and um, to do more, more involved uh, analytics, uh, descriptive analytics. For instance, we can group the data by occupation, which is a categorical variable, and then count the number of uh, records in each group in, for each occupation and sort the results by occupation and take the 10 largest. And so here we can see that for the occupation column, uh, Many have prof specialty, I don't know what it means. Professor specialty or uh, exec managerial sales, what? Uh, and we can also uh, make more advanced things with Panda. We can do the same group by operation, but in each group this time we will uh, apply this fu uh, Python function, which is a lambda expression, that will compute the mean of the income on each group by each occupation. So I'm using NumPy mean, the average, and then I will sort the values of the groups by average, uh, the average number of person that has an income that is larger than 50K. And, and uh, this way we can see where, how the occupations uh, impact the, the ability of people to have a high, high income. And you can see that uh, a very low fraction of uh, people doing private uh, house services. Uh, uh, they have a v almost none of them as a, as a yearly income uh, higher than 50K. Whereas if you do uh, um, management or you are a professor, I guess, I'm not sure what it is, or maybe professional specialty, I don't know. If you are a specialist in uh, something very specific, uh, you have a uh, higher chance uh, to have a large yearly income. So just by doing this, we can actually guess the income. Uh, you can, we can build rules by, by ourselves to try to guess the income. So we will try to find ways to transform those variables to make it easy for the machine learning algorithms to, to do that. So we can have a look at the or country of origin. You can see that most people come from the United States and then uh, Mexico, Philippines and so on. You can check the uh, the distribution of uh, the number of years of education. So uh, Pandas data frame, uh, they have plotting functions built in, and a histogram is one of them, hist. So you can just specify the columns you are interested in and the number of bins, and you can see the, uh, the 1D distribution of that specific column. We can do the same for age, and you can see that it's a very different distribution. And uh, horse, horse per week, and you can see there is a, a large peak at 40 horse per week, and and then uh, people working part time and uh, people working more than full time, <laughs> uh, almost one one hundred hours per week. Um, and what we can also do is a scatter plot using the plot function of pandas using the kind scatter to compare two attributes, to see the distribution of the data over two axes, so age and hours per week, for instance. And here you can see that we have a nonlinear distribution that relates the two. It's not a linear correlation. Uh, and you can explain this distribution by saying that, for instance, when you are young, uh, less than 20 years old, you have a higher likelihood to be a student and to work part-time and to be student part-time the, the rest of the time. Uh, whereas when you are middle age, uh, you have a higher likelihood to find a, a full-time job, 
And when you're older, after uh, 60, uh, some people uh, continue to work, but they tend to do that uh, part-time. And uh, we can specifically have, have a look at the, in at the income uh, distribution. And if we group by income, you can see that there are only two income levels in, in that distribution, over and under uh, 60, uh, 50K. And you can see that most of the people in, the, in this data set are under 50K, and only about a third uh, is above. And we can actually compute the exact fraction using NumPy mean and uh, a Boolean operator on that column. It's actually not a third, it's a quarter, uh, 25%, 24. Uh, so for, for machine learning, uh, for, for later to explain the, the behavior of the model, it's good uh, to extract the, the, the two possible names uh, of the target va variable uh, because they are strings and we just store them in, in an array called target names. And then we will use that later. Um, now, now that we have the two groups, uh, what we can do is a, a combined histogram using PLT ist uh, two times in the cell notebook cell uh, for the, the two, uh, the two uh, groups of data, low income and high income. And you can see that low income is just the data frame that has been filtered out using this mask expression in pandas. So it's a Boolean expression that will fil filter out the records based on whether or not this condition is true on, on the income column. And so we have two separate pandas data frame, and we can plot the two data frames on the same uh, on the same figure using matplotlib. And we we can see that uh, when you are younger, you're working part time. Many people are working part time, and you have higher likelihood to have a, a low low income. And then a large fraction of middle aged people tend to have a, a high income or a larger fraction. And then uh, that decreases uh, slowly until you. Okay, so let's do a, a, an exercise. So let's let's reuse those two uh, pandas data frame, low income and high income. But instead of, of doing this uh, uh, one D plot, let's do the same uh, two D scatter plot with age and hours per week, but with the two groups overlapped. So. Let's try to do that, and you can have a uh, look at the other, this as an example, and this as an example, and try to combine the two examples in, in this cell to, uh, to do this plot. And then try to draw some conclusions uh, on uh, what's inside the data. I forgot to tell at the beginning that uh, there will be a coffee break at 
Has anybody managed to do it? Yes, one, two. Give you uh, one minute more. <laughs> All right, so you can leave the cell in the state where it is, and in the bottom cell, there is a way to load the, the solution. So you can just uncomment this line and execute it, and it will basically uh, load the content of this file into the cell, and then you can execute the cell again. So here we do two scatter plots uh, overlapped, and because we use uh, uh, opacity level that is less than one, we can see the, the overlap. Uh, you can also control the size of the dots using 50. So this is a really a hacky way to plot the density map. Uh, there are better libraries to do that in uh, the Python ecosystem. Uh, but if you want to do it quickly with matplotlib, you can do it this way. Uh, so what is interesting in that plot is that you can see uh, that again, uh, the the high income uh, people uh, tend to be in the middle uh, on, of this 2D plane. And f more than this, you need to have a full-time job more than 40 hours a week to get a high, a high income. So we could have a model that just looks at the, uh, the number of times work per week. And if it's less than 40 hours a week, then it's very high. Uh, there is a very large likelihood that the, uh, the income is low. Uh, but for the for the people who work more than uh, 40 hours per week and it's very hard to guess you can say that if you're too young and you even if you work a lot if you are too young you you are not likely to to have a high income but other than that if you are in this rest in this group here you have the two distribution that overlap by quite a bit so it's not possible just by using those two features to make a good uh, prediction on the income if you are in this region, basically. So we need to combine the, uh, the, the data from the other features, the other columns to, make, to build a, a good model. So we won't do that by hand. This is a way to do it by hand, just by plotting stuff and making rules. rules. But instead, we are going to use scikit-learn. Uh, I think it's, it's good to first always to, uh, to have a, a good look at your data using pandas and matplotlib before trying to do machine learning black box, because if there is a weird thing in the distribution, if half of the values are zero or some uh, constant that is uh, meaningless, you need to, uh, to use plotting tools basically to, to detect those artifacts. They, they could be uh, data collection artifacts or they could be uh, uh, something in your data collection process. There is a bug in, in, in your system, for instance, that you are not aware of. And uh, if, you, if you don't do this, this kind of plot, it can be uh, very hard to, to detect them. But everything looks fine in this data set. Uh, so we will extract the numerical values of this data set as a NumPy array to make it possible to train a statistical uh, machine learning model using scikit-learn. So uh, first we need to separate the target variable from the input variables. Um, if you need, there's this. <laughs> yeah. uh, from the input variables, so there is the, uh, we can just select the income column and uh, get a, a panda series. And we can also do data that drop a specific column name with axis equal one. And that will generate a, a copy of the data frame without that column. The original data frame is not modified. So we have target and feature data. So out of this feature data here, 
uh, here. Uh, we will extract only the columns that are uh, of that have a numerical uh, data type. So the data type kind should be integer or floating point number. If this is the case, we store that we store them in a specific uh, uh, list of features. We collect the list of features uh, that, that are numerical, and then we can use these numerical features to to build a numerical data frame. And I'll just have a look at the first five rows. And so this data, we can directly feed it to scikit-learn because it's already numerical by nature. And most scikit-learn models, they will accept uh, numerical data. If it's not scaled or not pre-processed correctly, you, get, you can get uh, uh, wrong results or bad results, but you won't get an exception. Uh, for the other data, the, the categorical data using text labels or integer labels, uh, it's, we, we need to do some kind of pre-processing. And we will do that with pandas, uh, because it's uh, much easier. Uh, but uh, there are also ways to do that using the scikit-learn API, but I think it's better for uh, teaching to, to, to do that manually with pandas. I N F. What does it mean? So basically, here we extract the columns that have a data type. D type means data type that has a kind that is a, a subclass of integer or float. Basically, I is integer and F is float. Then they could be 32-bit integer, 64-bit integer, 32-bit float, 64-bit float, or unsigned or not for integers. Uh, as long as it's one of those kind, it's numerical. Uh, technically, I think in pandas or at least in NumPy, there is also complex data types. Uh, we we, we uh, don't use them for machine learning. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. So th this uh, weighting columns means that the uh, uh, if you want to get the true strat uh, to the true distribution of the full population in the U.S., you need to take those weights into account because some some sample some records are more representative than others. Of I think this is because in, when they do the survey, they uh, they try to investigate more in specific uh, groups of people. Uh, yeah. Actually, you can keep it and build the statistical models, and the kind of prediction that you get is, is the same. Like uh, most of the models, they will ignore that column because they don't find it informative. Hey, Tim. <laughs> uh, so, but it's just that if we want to make a correct statistical inference on, on this data, I think we should use that variable. But then we should uh, build a loss function for uh, to optimize our model that takes that into account. And I don't know how to do that, so. <laughs> I haven't tried to do it. Uh, so we would just assume that those records are representative by themselves, uniformly sampled at random, and they are representative enough. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to do this per column feature transformation, uh, it, it really depends on the, on the models. Some models like decision trees, for, in, for instance, they don't really care about the, um, um, the, the, this kind of uh, monotonic transformation that won't affect uh, their, their decision function much. Uh, but other models like uh, linear models or neural nets, they really need the standardized uh, data. And so you need to do this kind of uh, feature transformation. And so what you can do is, instead of doing it manually before, you can do that as uh, transformers in a pipeline and, and, uh, and do, do that later. But uh, right now I'm just doing it manu manually this way uh, so that we really understand the, the main uh, categorical value uh, transformation that we need to do. Um, Okay, so once we have the numerical features, uh, it's fine. What we can do is 
uh, take the uh, the other features. So if we drop, if we take features data again and we drop the numerical features on axis equal one. Just put axis; it's more explicit. Uh, here, uh, what we are left with is a new data frame with only categorical variables, uh, and they have uh, text labels for the categories. Uh, if if we do uh, if we call the describe uh, method on categorical variables, the kind of uh, statistics that we get are slightly different than previously. And we have the count, we have the number of unique categories, and we have the most representative, uh, most represented category uh, for each column and uh, the frequency, the number of times that it was observed. And so in particular, what is interesting to see here that some categories like uh, gender, sex, is only two possible values. Uh, whereas the country of origin is like 42. Uh, so depending on the kind of preprocessing that we do, we need to be aware that some category might be overrepresented uh, with respect to others. We can come back to that problem later. For now, we just ignore it. And because we are going to use uh, decision trees to build the statistical model, I know that we can encode the categories as arbitrary integers, and it's going to work quite good enough. So this, using this uh, uh, pandas that factorize operation uh, that are wrapped in a apply um, call to on the data, categorical data frame. Uh, basically, I will transform this data frame into that data frame where all the string, oh uh, no, not this one, <laughs> this one, all the, all the string labels will be mapped to a specific integer and then we have the integers. And then we have numerical features. Usually it's a, a bad numerical representation of the data for many models, like linear models, because uh, the, the quantities, they don't mean anything. It's just, we just need to know that they are different. Uh, and for decision trees, it's enough. So we are, we are going to do that. So we can reconstruct a full data frame, which, is, which we call features, which will concatenate the original numerical data and the, enc the integer coded uh, categorical data using uh, pd.concat. And now we have a data frame that has just numerical values, uh, and the categories are just encoded as integers. All right? So there are, there are different ways to, to encode categories, especially if you want to use support vector machine neural nets or uh, linear models logistic regression. This integer category, uh, categorical variable, is not a good representation. And instead, what you could do is use one hot encoded categorical variable. Uh, I won't explain what it means now, uh, but maybe at the end of the tutorial we have more time, if we have enough time. Uh, but if you want to try this, you can just uh, uncomment those two lines and execute that instead of the previous cell. But don't do it right now. But uh, you can do it at home if you want, and, and check that the rest of the notebook will still work, and actually the quality of the model is going to be approximately the same, it's just going to be a bit slower to execute. OK, so now that we have the features, we can convert them to NumPy arrays of a specific data type, uh, and we will call that X and Y, and this is the kind of data that scikit-learn models uh, es expect. So the input features, we use values and then as type are coded as 32-bit float, floating point numbers. And you see that we have uh, 32,000 records and uh, 13 features, 13 input attributes. And the target variable is just going to be a Boolean, 0 or 1, but encoded as an integer, and a 32-bit integer. Uh, it's just because uh, scikit-learn uh, classifiers, uh, they expect integers because there could be more than two classes. Um, and now, before training the first model, we will uh, split the training set into two uh, random uh, subsets uh, called the train set and the test set. And to do that, we can use the train test split function from scikit-learn. And here, I pass a specific random seed, random state equals zero, so that uh, this is a, a pseudo-random process, but we can get it deterministic by uh, fixing the random seed. And this test size equal 0.2 uh, argument here means that 80% uh, of the records will be in the training part, and 20% of the records will be uh, assigned to the test part. And as what we get as a result is x train that shape, for instance, is a numpy array 
uh, that has 80% uh, of the records here, you can count. <laughs> but it's a, it's a number arrays with uh, numerical values. And here you can see that we lost the, the information of the column names and so on. It's uh, just numerical. Uh, and actually, the machine learning algorithm, they don't care. Just process uh, numbers, and they just need the, the correct numbers. But uh, it's just us that need the, the column names uh, for interpreting what uh, the data is about. Um, so we will train a first decision tree classifier. Uh, so we, as I presented previously with, on the slides, we just import it from scikit-learn. Uh, we defined the instance of the model by calling the, the class constructor with a hyperparameter. In that case, we just fix one hyperparameter, which is the maximum depth of the decision tree, and we fit it. Uh, so it's very quick here because uh, the data set is small. Uh, but depend if you have millions of records, it can be longer. And uh, if you fit a bunch of trees instead of a single decision tree, it can be even longer. Um, once we have the classification model, uh, this um, is modified uh, in place. The CLF uh, classifier model uh, is modified in place. And so we can call the predict method on uh, the test data and get some predictions. So the, the predictions, uh, I forgot to display maybe before, x test. It's good to have a look at the shape of your data to, to as a sanity check when you're doing feature engineering like this to make sure that you have a, something that makes sense. So the, the new records, there are 6,513 uh, uh, records uh, with the same 13 columns. And we ask the model to make one prediction for each of those uh, rows in, in that new data. And we don't make individual prediction by, one by one because uh, it can be much faster uh, from a computational point of view to batch the predictions into a, a C function or whatever. So we can have a look at the first five uh, elements of the pr prediction arrays. And you can see that some of them are predicted as zero, so low income, and some of them are predicted as one, so high, high income. And we can compare that uh, to the true values, x test. So those are the true labels from the original data set that has been split in half. And you can see that for most of them, it's, it's making a good prediction. Uh, like the first three, they are correct. The last one, it's also correct. But the one here, it, it, it's make, it made a mistake. So here is a small exercise. It's just using NumPy. Compare those two, uh, those two arrays and compute the average accuracy of, of, the, of the model. All right, so uh, how much is it? 90, 95? 85, yeah. I think so. So let's, let's do it. So we can just use NumPy mean and compare the two arrays using the equality operator. Uh, 1885, yes. So actually in scikit-learn we have a a function to do that, but uh, <laughs> which is called accuracy, accuracy score, but it's quite easy to do it manually. So there, this is the basic uh, uh, metric, but for classification problems, sometimes uh, you have an issue because the two target classes, if you have two classes, one of them is overrepresented. You have a majority class and a minority class. For instance, if you are trying to detect spam, most of the emails is gonna be regular emails, but you have a small fraction that is, for instance, 1% of the email, are going to be spam. And if you, if you have a classification model that always predicts there is no spam, there is no spam, this classification model will have 99% accuracy. So the accuracy metric in that case is not very meaningful. So there are alternative classification metrics that 
that better uh, reflect the, the power of classification model on uh, imbalanced uh, data sets. So here we will uh, introduce a performance metric which is called uh, area under rock curve. And rock means uh, receive, receiver operator characteristic, I think, uh, which is something from the uh, signals uh, literature. Uh, but it's also useful um, uh, to quantify the performance of a, uh, classification models. And uh, so to, to compute that score, we'll need to, uh, to, uh, uh, to compute predictions in a different way. Instead of calling predict, we will call predict proba. And because our classification model can be interpreted as a, a probabilistic model, uh, we can get a confidence level of the model. And so, uh, actually, for a single decision tree, it's not going to be a very good uh, estimate of the confidence level, but uh, it, at, at least it's not zero, it's not binary. And and so here you can see that for the first five elements, it, it has uh, two columns. The first column is a predict the probability, the confidence level or probability of uh, the output being uh, negative and the second column out the output being positive so if you sum the the rows they should sum to one because this could be interpreted as probabilities so we can just uh, consider the second column for the probability of uh, positive predictions and you can see that the model is very confident for the last two uh, predictions and it's quite confident that those are negative as well for the first one and this one is a bit less confident so now that we have these um, uh, probabilistic uh, predictions, we can uh, use the rock AUC score function from scikit-learn and compute this rock AUC score. And it's a value between 0 and 1. And uh, a, a, a model that predicts completely at random will have uh, a score of 0.5 um, in expectation. So random models, bad models, there they should be around 0.5. And perfect models that never make a mistake, uh, they, sh they should have a one uh, as a rock uh, score. So 0 0.9 is quite good, but uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't really mean anything. Actually, it means something better. Uh, yes, uh, it's just you should use that to compare two different models or two different feature sets. You can use that to, to select the best one. Um, so there is an issue though right now is that we did a single train test split and we we computed the score on the test set uh, but if we tweak the model if we change the model class if we change the hyperparameter of the model we might get a better score but we don't really know uh, whether it's going to hold in the future on new data because by tweaking the parameters we are basically learning and we because we are learning using the testing set we don't know whether or not we are cheating uh, so it's a bad idea to do that. So instead of doing, uh, uh, of uh, measuring the quality of the model uh, when we are developing the model, we should never uh, measure the quality of the model on the final test set. We should keep it for later. So forget that we used it now. <laughs> and instead, we will use cross-validation. So cross-validation is a procedure to evaluate the quality of the model on a on validation set. So assume that we have a big training set like this. And when I say training set, it's actually X and Y. And those are the records, the samples. Uh, here, we have split it uh, for a train and a test. And, and this test set, we will keep it uh, for later. We ignore it. And when we do cross-validation, basically, we will use the training part of, of the data set. And we will split it into additional folds, like for instance, five, one, two, three, four, five. And we will build new training sets out of that by recombining uh, one, three, four, five, for instance. We just uh, don't use that. And, and uh, the, the fold number two here will be kept separated as a new validation set, OK? And then we can do uh, the same with one. Actually, I, I forgot to do one. I will do it first here. We can use the full number one as, a, as the validation set. And then we just ignore that. And two, three, four, five. And this is a new training set. And we do that several times, five times. 
And for each of, of those uh, reconfiguration of the data, we will train a, a, a new model, for, for instance, CLF1 <laughs> here, C classifier 1, classifier 2, classifier 3, and until 5. So we'll train five classification models, and we we will compute the the, uh, the uh, accuracy metric or the rock AUC metric five times. So it could be, for instance, uh, 0.85 here, uh, 0.86. Uh, because there is some um, randomness in the way we reshuffle the, the samples, it's not it's going to be slightly different each time. And then the final cross-validation score is going to be the average of those uh, five scores. And it's going to represent the ability of our model to generalize on this data set without looking at the final uh, test set. And at the end of the procedure, when we have found the best model that has the best cross-validation score, we can actually com compute the true uh, test accuracy and compare that to the, uh, the uh, cross-validation accuracy and see whether or not uh, they, they match. They should match. If they don't match, it means that we made a mistake so, uh, uh, somewhere uh, in, in our code. It's a methodological mistake that can be det detected this way. So to do this full procedure in scikit-learn, we can just use cross -val score, <laughs> uh, And uh, we just give that function uh, the, the classification model that we want to evaluate. And the, the, the full training set, the number of cross-validation folds that we want to use, could be 3, 5, 10. Uh, usually, between 5 and 20 is fine, uh, or, um, if you do k-fold cross-validation. So use 5 or 10. Uh, if you use 10, it's going to be uh, twice as slower than if you use 5, but uh, then you get slightly more stable uh, estimate. Uh, and, and we will also um, uh, give the name of the accuracy metric that we want to use, or the performance metric that we want to use. In this case, it's rock AUC. And so if I execute this, I get the, the scores of the individual folds, uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.89, uh, 89, and so on. And I can also compute uh, the average score across the cross-validation folds and the standard deviation to, to get some confidence level in our estimate. Uh, so here you can see that it's around this value and uh, it's fluctuating uh, on this scale, basically. So if you compare two different models and you see that the, 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 the uh, cross-validation score uh, difference is on the, the scale of the standard deviation of the um, scores across fold, uh, then it means that they are basically performing the same, and you should you should consider them the same, basically. Uh, do you have questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it's a very good question. Uh, by default, the k-fold cross-validation model uh, uh, tool that is used by uh, this uh, function does not randomize to get a deterministic output. Uh, but if you want to randomize, uh, you can, instead of pa passing an integer here, you can pass a CV object. And uh, if you Google cross-validation, I think just if, if you Google cross-validation alone, you should find the scikit-learn documentation. No. <laughs> Uh, you, will, you will find the documentation with all the cross-validation strategies. There are many of them. So k-fold cross-validation that I presented here is the most traditional way to do it. Uh, but there are many of them. Uh, so where are they? Yeah, the cross-validation iterators. Um, so they, many of them, uh, they make the assumption that the data is I, I, uh, I don't, independent and identically distributed, um, which means that if you shuffle, uh, that should not change the, the outcome. If it's not the case and, and you want to generalize, um, 
Actually, you can use the, the fact that you shuffle and not, and if you get a different result, it's a, a, a good clue that your data is not IID. And then you should extract, identify the group structure, the group, uh, the groups of samples, and use that to uh, build a cross-validation scheme that, that take that into account. And if you want to do a group-based um, uh, cross-validation, uh, you can use, no, not this one, this one. Uh, cross-validation iterators for group data, and you have group K fold and uh, leave one group out and stuff like that. To, for instance, uh, if you have, uh, if you record several stuff on a specific subject, and you have uh, 10 subjects and uh, 10 records per subject, and you build a model that predicts stuff on, on, on people, uh, you want to, to generalize across people. So you should keep a test set of a specific person that has ne never been seen in the, in the training set. So you can treat a subject ID as a group ID. Or you could use, uh, if you have several uh, record devices, uh, like a, um, a scanner, for instance, and you should make, uh, for instance, the use uh, a sp records um, a recorded with a specific can scanner in the test set and uh, and train with a uh, on data that from different scanners, so that you can measure the the ability of the model to generalize across a recording device, and you're actually uh, not uh, memorizing specific artifact of individual scanners. Um, okay. So I think we should st stop now. Uh, maybe just a question, but then there is a break. Yes. Yes. So the question is, can I pass anything that has a fit and a predict here to cross Vascore? Uh, Yes, uh, and if you don't provide the scoring function here, I think you should also implement the score method, and it will use the default score uh, method of, of the subject. Uh, but if you want to build your own estimators, it's it's a good idea to have a look at the scikit-learn documentation where we document the, the protocol or the API of the estimator. And there is also a base estimator class that you can use to derive, but it should work even though if you don't derive from that class. But I'm not sure, 100% sure. But it should work in m many cases. Uh, we make uh, as few assumptions as possible. OK, so I think we should break now because the coffee is warm and then come back in, I think it's 15 minutes or something. Okay, see you soon. <laughs>